Hello, and thank you for tuning in for the Science in the News weekly lecture series live stream. I'm Amy Gilson, co-director of Science in the News, and tonight we'll be hearing about extreme weather and its relationship to climate change. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. And when we do, please participate in the lecture by asking questions using the link above and at the end. Give us some feedback about the live stream experience in the form below. We'll answer most of the questions submitted during the lecture, but if we don't have the chance to answer yours on air, we'll do our best to shoot you an email with the answer after the lecture. Thanks for being with us for our last lecture of the series. We'll get started in just a couple minutes.
pleasure. So I'm Amy Gilson, one of the other co-directors of Science in the News. And uh, so the lecture tonight is going to be in three parts, like three chapters, um, each given by a graduate student who studies atmospheric science at Harvard. Um, so during each of the parts, there will be a couple pauses for, for questions. And uh, if you uh, want to ask anything, just raise your hand, and the speaker can call on you. Uh, after the second part of the lecture, there will be a five or ten minute break. And if you'd like to chat with any of the speakers um, or have any more questions, you can come down to the front and talk to them. And then when the lecture is over, um, there will be another chance to talk with them. Uh, and then in a, a couple of minutes after it's done, they're going to do a demonstration, which they'll tell you a little bit more about, where they show you uh, sort of where you can find, I think, data online right, to learn about the climate yourself. Um, so I have two pieces of uh, paper in my hand here. Uh, one of them is the lecture handout. Hopefully you um, have a good these. And this has a little bit more information about the lecture, glossary of terms, um, and some links where you can uh, learn uh, learn more about uh, climate. And uh, right here, I have um, our lecture series survey. And so if you can pick one of these out and just let us know how we're doing, what you like, what could be improved in the lecture, and then just leave it on the table at the end, we really appreciate it. So without further ado, Thank you all again very much for coming. And I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Ethan. Hello. Can you hear me? I got you uh, I'm Ethan Butler. I'm a sixth year graduate student at Harvard in Earth and Planetary Science. Uh, my advisor is Peter Hybers, and my primary research focus is on how crop yields are affected by climate variation. So we're going to talk to you tonight about extreme weather and its causes, effects, and connections with climate. So this roadmap, this roadmap is going to, is uh, details of the three portions of the lecture. So I'm going to begin by talking about types and impacts of extreme weather to sort of motivate the second two sections on storms, rain, and climate change, and then heat waves. So this diagram illustrates some of the various elements of extreme weather that you might find within the climate system. And on the x-axis, we have sort of adequacy of data. So on the far side here, we would have highly adequate data. And then on this end, we would have inadequate data. And then on the y-axis, we have physical understanding. So again, at this end, we have poorly understood phenomena. And at the top end, we have well understood phenomena. So like I said before, we're going to focus on heat waves and precipitation, which you'll note are both at the adequate data and well-understood section. We're going to touch on a couple other elements, um, a little bit on hurricanes here, but we wanted to steer well, and on droughts and floods, but we wanted to steer away from some of the more contentious topics that might come up. OK, so we're going to talk about extremes. And if you're going to talk about extremes, then you need to talk about probability. And not everyone in this audience is probably that comfortable thinking about probability, so I wanted to start out nice and simple. Um, we're going to talk about probability distributions a lot. And what I have up here is possibly the simplest probability distribution after a single coin flip. So this is a six-sided die, and if this is a fair die, the probability of any side coming up is going to be equal, 1 in 6, or a 16.66% chance. So that's simple. What happens if we roll two dice? So what we have here is the probability distribution of rolling two dice and adding the sums of the faces together. So now instead of values from 1 to 6, we have values from 2 to 12. One of the terms that you're going to hear us talk about a lot this evening is the average or mean. We're going to try to say average, but we might occasionally slip to mean. So the average of this distribution is 7. And what we'll commonly do when we talk about distributions to sort of get everything onto a common footing is talk about it in terms of anomalies. So anomalies are when you remove the mean from the distribution. So now you can see for the role of the sum of two dice, rather than going from 2 to 12, we go from minus 5 to 5, and the mean having been removed is no longer 7, it's 0. 
So when we talk about temperature distributions and precipitation distributions, we'll often talk about them in terms of anomalies. And that's just the same as what we did here with dice, but for the mean temperature or the average precipitation. OK, so what makes a value extreme? Um, if we just look at a distribution like this, what criteria are we going to use to determine what makes an extreme value in it? Um, we might pick some somewhat arbitrary cutoff, say a value that's greater than 95% of the other values. That would mean that only rolling a 12 on two six-sided dice is an extreme value. We might say an extreme value is greater than 90%. That would make an 11 or a 12 an extreme value. I'm not actually going to answer that question directly right now. Uh, I'm just using this to sort of illustrate the challenge in terms of determining what makes an extreme value just given a probability distribution. But there are certain elements um, that sort of generate natural extremes. So what we're looking at here are sort of human temperature extremes. Um, this is generated from the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Association's weather um, heat index. And now what we have is temperature in Fahrenheit on the x-axis and relative humidity on the y-axis. And then the color coding indicates the sort of level of danger that you would be in given a particular temperature and relative humidity. So the yellow would be caution up to red is extreme danger. So I said this might give you something of a less arbitrary cutoff, but I think it also illustrates that it's still hard to pick, say, a single temperature value that would indicate an extreme temperature, because the effect on the human body depends not just on the absolute temperature value, but also on the humidity. Um, this is one of the only instances in the talk that temperatures are going to be in Fahrenheit. For most of this, they're going to be in Celsius. Um, for those less comfortable with the conversion, um, so excuse me, to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius is going to be minus 32 times 5 ninths. That's hard to do in your head. You can approximate it with minus 30 divided by 2. That's pretty close. OK. So another way that you can get um, a sort of non-human temperature response is we could look at plants and temperature stress. So this is from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And the x-axis here is temperature, now in Celsius. And the y-axis is growth rate. And you can see that plants grow, won't grow if it's too cold. And they also won't grow when it's too hot. They have some optimal temperature where their growth rate reaches its highest value. So you could define an extreme temperature for plants as temperatures that exceed some optimal growth rate. I also want to note, and this is, going, this is a sort of common feature of biological responses to extremes, that there is sort of a slower response going from cooler temperatures up to the optimum than there is going from the, going from the optimum temperature into hotter temperatures. It's a more uh, rapid decline from the optimum going into hotter temperatures than it is an increase going from cooler temperatures up to the optimum. OK. So now I'm going to transition from setting up extremes in general, and I'm going to start to talk about some specific instances of extremes and the impacts that they had on the human population. So this is sort of case studies to motivate why we want to know more about what causes and drives extremes. So the first part of this is heat waves. And some of you may remember from the news that Europe had some pretty monstrous heat waves in 2003 and 2010. So what we're looking at here is another probability distribution. This time it's temperature anomalies. So remember, just like we had with the dice, except this is now temperature that's been set to a mean of zero. And this is average temperature over the entire summer, OK? So the range actually isn't that large, right? Just minus 2 to plus 2c. But remember that this is over the entire summer. So that's a number of, that's going to be three months, June, July, and August. And the color coding on here indicates how, how far each summer's mean temperature departs from the average, from zero. 
So as we go to these warmer colors from yellows into oranges and then reds, we're getting into hotter extremes. And as we go into cooler summers from these light blues into the dark blues, we get cooler extremes. Um, each one of these lines represents a single summer's temperature. So this is from the instrumental record, so weather stations, um, as long as those exist. And then before the instrumental record exists, there's a sort of uh, proxy reconstruction. So you may have heard about building temperatures with tree rings or sediment cores. That's what fills in the years prior to the temperature record on this. Um, not going to go into too much detail on that. But that's how we can get temperatures back to 1695 here. And what I want to call your attention to is from this long 500-year temperature record, what are the two most extreme years? Well, here's 2003, way out on the right, beyond everything else, except for 2010. So that's sort of all of the summers aggregated together. What happens if we break it down and look at the spatial pattern of temperature in each of those years? So now this is 2003 on the left and 2010 on the right. And the map that we're looking at is the seven-day maximum temperature. So this is the average maximum temperature over seven days. And this color bar is, again, anomalies that go from zero, but now all the way up to 15 Celsius. So this was a seven-day period that, in 2003, in the south of France here, was 11.2 degrees C hotter than the average. And then in 2010, Right center of Moscow, this patch here, was 13.3 degrees Celsius hotter than the average for an entire week. Um, that's pretty hard to put in perspective. Um, and I know the color bar on these maps isn't the greatest, but just for some context, in an average summer, this entire map would be white. Okay? So what happened from those two heat waves? Well, 2003, the estimates vary, but it was somewhere between 46,000 and 70,000 people died. Uh, EU meat production declined by 10%. And then in 2010, something on the order of 16,000 people died in the country sort of surrounding Western Russia, so from Kazakhstan over. And Russian grain harvest declined by as much as 20%. OK, a little bit closer to home, and more recently, we have the American heat wave from 2012. So this is now looking at something slightly different than temperatures. What we've got here is a map of drought. And the colors here represent a sort of severity of drought, where the whites indicate no drought, into yellows that indicate moderate drought, all the way into this deep red that indicates an exceptional and extremely severe drought. We also have these letters that indicate the duration of the drought. So S is a short-term drought, less than six months. And then L is a long-term drought that's greater than 12 months. Um, so you can see this sort of bullseye right over the center of the country. This is August of 2012, um, which was the greatest extent of that drought. And it had a pretty massive effect on American crops, but not as severe a one uh, on human population, thankfully. So this resulted in about 80 deaths, but a decline in corn yields of over 25%. So with that, I will pause before moving on to uh, hurricanes and precipitation for questions. I'm surprised to see ice. Uh, in that location. Um, and this, as, you know, why is there a, a, oh, ice I ice there's an inadequacy of data and poorly understood physics? I, I'm just surprised to see it there. Yeah, so my guess for that would be that polar orbiting satellites haven't been around for very long, so in terms of global coverage. Um, we also can't observe down into ice very well. Whereas for something like, you know, heat waves, you just need surface temperature, which we have a pretty long time series of. Other questions? A little 
telescope, but we were showing the, the data of the mean over the five year course of course, the arc. So, I mean, I see a lot of the, the cold temperatures are longer periods over the 1800s. I'm just curious because there seems to be, uh, last time I was done in college was like 20 years ago, but there seems to be a debate as to when the little ice age ended. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you thought that might have impacted that. Because I was always taught, I mean, I'm, I, I have history. Yeah. yeah. I was always taught the, 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 the little ice age ended somewhere in the Middle Ages. And I've heard a lot of debate, or read a lot of articles that a lot of people think it was more stretched out in the 70s or the 80s. Yeah, so I think I, I have also, I, I do not study uh, in detail climate sort of that far back, but I think one can make a reasonable argument that the Little Ice Age is certainly extended into the 17th century and maybe the beginning of the 18th century as well. I, I, I think of three Little Ice Ages, the most recent ending around the end of the 19th century. The second one around the time of Columbus, the first one in the medieval afternoon, not off the like there's more than one the way I read the record. Okay. I mean, you know, as we do the paleoclimate reconstructions, there is a lot of uncertainty with those. So, you know, depending, one record's wiggles might not be another record's wiggles, I suppose. And the reason why I just I think about it is because people that the anti-global warming tend to put those temperatures in the 1800s as a normal Sure. I also note that the mode and probably the mean of that distribution appears to be less than zero. Is that something you've uh, worked with a little bit? Yeah, so I, I noted that on this too, right? So he's indicating that sort of this point right here, right, is sort of that measures of central tendency of the distribution is just, just shy of zero rather than above. Yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, though the distribution that they fit to this is centered well at zero. So they may have just, you know, that's just the binning and then, and then they, they fit a distribution to it that they then centered at zero and took the anomalies relative to that. Um, do you know why there were so many deaths in Europe? I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so I, 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 my, my, my interpretation of it is it's where the heat wave hit. Right? So if you look, you know, so France is heavily populated, and the heat wave's bullseye was right on France. You know? This isn't right on Moscow, but it's pretty close to right on Moscow, which is one of the most heavily populated areas of Western Europe. And then if you compare that to our heat wave last year, you know, the center of the country is much more sparsely populated. If we had had a bullseye like this right over the East Coast, I don't know that it would have been as bad as Europe, because my understanding is that there's a lot more air conditioning in the US than there is in France or Moscow. But, um, you know, it may have been a different story then. Uh, you showed a chart with uh, a variation in the growth rate uh, with respect to the temperature. Yeah, that one. Uh, would you expect, say, as the climate change, that the skewness of that curve to change? No. So, so you might expect that some plants that are adapted to different environments would have some adjustments to a curve like this. This is, this is sort of a general fit. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect it to change too substantially. So, so my work has really focused on how American maize has been affected by climate change. And what I found there is that all across the US, there is a response like this. But in the South, there's this sort of slope, right? The degree that it goes down on the extremely hot side is less than it is in the north. So there is a certain degree of variability in response based on the environment that the plant is from. OK. That's probably good for us to move on. There will be time for more questions at the end.
Okay, so hurricanes. Um, I hope everyone remembers Katrina in 2005 and Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Just some satellite images here to remind us of uh, those events. So I'm going to focus on different metrics for each of these. So this is a map of New Orleans. Um, this is August 31st. And the color coding overlaid on the city is flooding. Uh, depth in feet. So red is 0 to 1 foot up to uh, blue would be greater than 20 feet. You can see that almost the entire city um, on the uh, Gulf of Mexico side of the river is something like six or seven feet below water. Um, so flooding is sort of a different metric than precipitation to look at, but I thought that this was sort of a stark reminder of um, what happens when the protections that are in place get overwhelmed. And what were the effects of Hurricane Katrina? Um, so obviously not just from this flooding in New Orleans, but the total right now, when I last checked into it, was something like nearly 2,000 deaths and over 100 billion in property damage. Hurricane Sandy, a little bit closer to home for this one. So now what we're looking at is, this is just precipitation over the East Coast here, color-coded from one inch in this sort of tan up to 10 inches in that dark purple. You can see the highest officially recorded, there were some higher unofficially recorded precipitations, was 12.83 inches in Easton, Maryland. So that's right around here. And I looked up the average yearly rainfall in Maryland, and it's 45.2 inches. So that means one storm event, and this is probably not just you know, one day, but over the course of the rains that they got from Hurricane Sandy, was over 25% of their entire yearly precipitation. So what it, the, 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 to, the tally that I saw from Sandy was something like 300 deaths, um, both direct and indirect, something like 68 billion in property damage. So Katrina was the most damaging um, extreme event in American history. Sandy is number two. But I also wanted to remember that um, it's not, you know, all I have shown here is the U.S., but of course this extended beyond the U.S., and the Caribbean was also significantly affected. And then, interestingly, and not something we're going to address directly, Sandy is the largest Atlantic hurricane that's on record. So to cover something that's a little bit further from home, we've got the flooding in Pakistan from 2010. I'm going to dim the lights for a second to try and get this figure a little bit more. Okay, can you see the black lines on the sky better now? Okay, so what we're looking at here is precipitation from satellite estimates on the left. And then this is a false color satellite image of the Indus River on the right. So 2009, um, the year before flooding, which will sort of take to be a normal year, and we're going to focus on this area in the White Oval, which sort of corresponds to this Indus River Valley right here. Um, so here, this is sort of an idea of what the typical rainfall is like. Something from almost not going to, no, sorry, this is rainfall from July 1st to the 23rd of August. Um, something like almost no rainfall in the south of the valley, right where it empties out um, into the Indian Ocean, up to the neighborhood of like maybe 600 millimeters over the course of those two months in the north. And then in 2010, you can see that it's much more widespread. Um, and what was the effect of that? So this is sort of typical stream flow from 2009. So here, the dark blue represents the sort of false color image, right? So this image has been colored to sort of more accurately represent um, what the colors are. So blue for water, green for vegetation, and then this sort of brownish for desert or low vegetated ground. Um, and you can see the sort of river valley marked out by that green swath. And then what happens in 2010? Well, this whole basin in the north is now completely inundated in water. 
and the entire river valley is now full of water, um, extending way out into the surrounding land. So this map is sort of another way to summarize that. Um, now this is a little bit more sort of um, politically divided, where the light blue indicates a, a district with minor flooding, um, the sort of intermediate blue, a district with major flooding, and then the, this dark blue, which you only see sort of right along the edges of the river, would be a completely inundated area. So what was the result here? Six million people displaced, um, nearly 2,000 killed, and two million homes destroyed, and 1.4 million acres of cropland gone. Pretty great. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that heat waves and hurricanes and flooding and droughts are responsible for widespread death and damage. But remember, I, we put this section of the talk first as sort of motivation, right? So I hope that these severe impact, impacts sort of inspire an improved understanding of both the physics and statistics of these types of extreme events so that we can either predict and then prepare for them better in the future. And I wanted to note that attribution of these events to global warming is challenging, but that regardless of that challenge, a changing climate is only going to make understanding these events harder. Um, any questions on flooding or going back to the first portion? Yeah, so if, uh, if the climate system weren't changing right now, then sort of the entire historical record that we have, we would be able to sort of compare fairly with what we're in with the climate state that we are in now and that we're moving into. But as it is, we need to say, okay, not only how would we understand these events given the record that we have, but also how do we understand how these events will change, given that the entire climate system is changing with them? Is that, is, does that make it more clear? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's a moving target. It's a, exactly. It's a moving target. Um, I guess another way that you could think about it is, you know, if, if every time, if, if every weather event is a roll of the dice, like that distribution I showed at the beginning, and climate change is adding one to one of those dice sides, then when we're trying to base our understanding on the historical values of the dice, you know, suddenly we roll the dice and a 13 comes up and we said 13 is impossible on two dice. Well, it's not if the values are changing. Other questions? Not so much a question, but when I graduated high school in 83, our science teacher was telling us that we're going to get all of this stuff, you know, the heavier changes out of location um, in weather events, and she's been spot on year by year. Hmm. You know, with the, you know, look, with the uh, industrialization of China, and usually when countries first industrialize, they don't care too much about emissions, and uh, it seems all this stuff is just marching right along. Interesting. <laughs> We thought she was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Hey, any other questions or let's come along? Thank you. Yeah, I turned it off for the transfer, so get yourself up dress. I know. Sorry. Okay, ready for it on? All right. Well, thank you to Ethan for the introduction to extremes and why we care about them and why we're studying them. Um, my name is Karen McKinnon, and I work uh, with the same advisor as Ethan and Andy as well, Peter Hybers, um, in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences here at Harvard. And I'm going to start moving into discussions of specific extremes on um, their understanding of the physics and statistics of them. 
uh, specifically focusing on storms, which have been fun in terms of their rain values um, and that connection to climate change. So a brief outline of um, what I'll be talking about. First, uh, presenting some observations of changes in heavy precipitation and storminess. Um, then talking briefly about interpreting trends in extreme events and why that can be challenging. And finally, uh, the climate change component, connecting changes in temperature that we're observing with changes in precipitation. So to begin kind of the big question in the room, especially as of a little over a week ago with uh, Typhoon Haiyan, is, is there a connection between storms and climate change? And I did a just Google Scholar, sorry, Google News search, I think the day after Haiyan for storms and climate change. And I think it probably wouldn't have changed that much if I did it this morning of a lot of discussion about this connection, a potential connection between the changing climate and big typhoons and hurricanes that we're observing. Um, and this is a really important question because, you know, if climate change causes a certain storm event or is causing changes in storm events, then there are questions like, is one country responsible for paying for the damages in another country and things like that. Um, those are questions I think are not best answered by scientists, and so we're not going to go further into them now or tonight. Um, but kind of food for thought in terms of um, motivation for understanding the changing climate and the connection with storms. Um, so here I'm going to define a storm as actually an extreme rain event, so not necessarily a hurricane, but rather just high precipitation events, uh, since there's not really a very specific de definition of storm. So to give an example of what we're talking about, um, this is a photo from the UK, uh, York in 2000. There were some very prominent extreme flooding events that happen there. Um, Brisbane, Australia in 2011, you can see the Ferris wheel has been inundated a bit by some water. And um, this one for me is closer to home. This is my hometown, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, just a couple months ago in 2013, we got flooding unlike we've ever seen. Uh, this is my high school sports field that became the source of a waterfall. So that was a, a close hit to home in terms of extreme storms. <clears throat> Uh, now, like I said, I'm going to begin talking a little bit about just the data. What do we actually know about precipitation and how it's changing? And uh, an important part of this is just where are we measuring? And so here's a map of the world uh, showing where we have precipitation gauges. Um, don't worry too much about the colors. They're not important for what we're talking about now. Um, but just notice the distribution. So for instance, in the US and then Canada and Mexico, we are basically totally covered in space with uh, measurements of precipitation. Um, the same is true in much of Europe and Asia and Australia. Um, but as you can see, for instance, in almost all of Africa, there has not been a lot of measurement of precipitation. And that might be a place that uh, matters a lot how precipitation might be changing people's lifestyles. Uh, same thing for most of South America, um, parts of Southeast Asia. And so um, when we talk about observations and changes in precipitation, we really can only talk about places that we actually are measuring. And in case you're wondering how you measure precipitation, there are a couple of different ways, but this is kind of the most basic. Uh, this is a precipitation gauge that's used in a program in the US where people actually, um, community members, measure precipitation at their own homes or offices. And they just install these little gauges. So the technology is quite simple. Essentially, the rain comes to the top and it fills up this little vial. And you can come outside and, and just let the um, organizer of the subscriber to know how much it's going to be in your location. So the tech can be very simple, um, but we still aren't measuring in much of the world. So based on those locations that we are measuring precipitation, we can start asking the question, has heavy precipitation changed since we've been measuring it? And this study looked at um, the relationship between changes in heavy precipitation and changes in just your average precipitation. And so they classified places in terms of places where heavy precipitation has increased more than the mean or more than the average, and then and that's these black, or sorry, maybe blue pluses that you see in much of the world. Um, and then the minuses are places where heavy precipitation has increased less than the average precipitation. And note, of course, that places that are not in gray, generally they have not made um, a judgment about changes, and those align well with where we actually are measuring precipitation at all. So what you can see is that in most of the world, not 100%, um, heavy precipitation appears to be changing more than the average. Um, and so even if your kind of average heavy precipitation is unchanging, you might have more extreme heavy events. 
Um, now focusing in a little bit closer to home, looking at the U.S. Um, what I'm first showing up here is just a time series of U.S. average um, extreme events and heavy precipitation beginning in the 1900s and going all the way up to the 2000s. Um, on the y-axis, they could find um, the relative number of extreme events. It doesn't matter exactly what these numbers are, but essentially, of course, the toss that you have more extreme events and it's negative becomes fewer. Um, how they're defining an extreme precipitation event in this study is the top 20% of precipitation events. And so that's if you think of having a five-sided die, like what Ethan was talking about earlier, that would be, say, every time you get a five, they're counting that as an extreme precipitation event. And so you can see that it does seem that there is a trend from the 1900s to the present um, with increases in these events. Now we can break it down further regionally. Um, and so there are a couple of regions all around the country where they've done the same analysis. And you see there's a lot of variability across the country. So for instance, in the southeast, there has been an increase in heavy precipitation events. Um, in Hawaii, there has been a smaller number of heavy precipitation events in the last two decades. And finally, in places like the Northwest, it's a little bit unclear. It's hard to tell what's going on. There seems to be some increases and some decreases. And additionally, the authors looked at um, if any of these changes were statistically significant, as in there's actually some confidence that these trends are real. And what they find is for the U.S. average as a whole, for the Midwest and for the Southwest, sorry, the Southeast, um, there was a statistically significant increase in heavy precipitation events. Um, however, for all these other regions, they actually were unable to make a comment about whether these changes were meaningful. And so that a handle on why that can be hard, why it can actually be hard to understand um, trends or the lack of trends in heavy precipitation or other extreme events. I'm going to take you through a quick kind of theoretical example um, that will help us hopefully interpret trends in extreme events. So imagine you're moving somewhere and they say, you can buy this house, um, but this house, just so you know, is in five years floodplain. And so what they mean by that um, is that there is, every year there's a 20% chance of a flood of certain size. So remember what I said about the definition of extreme precipitation in the previous slide, um, they defined it as a top 20% event. So it's the same thing. If you roll a five that die, the five comes up, that's when you're going to have an extreme event. Um, to look at it in terms of a distribution, like what Ethan showed us earlier, um, if this is your distribution of precipitation anomalies that are the scales that matter, um, the top 20% is basically this tail. Um, so it's not super extreme, but you know, one in five chance. So what would you actually expect to see with this distribution? Uh, would you expect to see every five years you would always have one event? Would you expect to see maybe, you know, maybe not one every five years, but you would definitely have two every ten years? Um, we can answer that question by just using some random number generators and looking at a time series. So let's look down here. So I've just taken um, a random number generator and I've said, you know, give me one of these top 20% of the values happened. We're going to call that a flood. And otherwise, um, we're not going to have a flood. So this is just a synthetic time series. It doesn't matter. But over 100 years, um, these events are set to happen um, with a 20% probability every single year. So what you can see, um, I'm sorry, these dash lines separate five-year periods, is that although this is called the five-year flood, um, you have a long periods, for instance, where you can go, you know, 30 years, or sorry, uh, 20 years, and not have any of these five-year floods. So if you were going to buy that house, and you look at buying the house around this time, you might say, you know, they're saying we have a side of flood, but it hasn't had this flood in 15 years, and I'm feeling pretty good and about the house. Um, other periods, you could be looking at this period and say, wow, well, if you've had a few of these side of floods in five years, maybe there's some time to be happening. But really, in this whole time series, nothing's changing. The probability of these events is staying the same, but there's just inherent randomness in the climate system, um, which is captured by this. So, now if we want to think about kind of the harder question that Ethan got at and there was a question about, of um, what if there's actually a change in that probability? Like, how are we able to interpret that and know that from the observational record? So, if someone says, okay, there's a climate change, this five year flood used to have has now become a four year flood. So, that means that 25% chance of getting this flood every single year, um, you're now rolling a four sided die, and the four is if you get the flood. And so the question is, what will our observations of the flood look like? Can we actually tell that the probability has changed? 
And so um, I'm showing a similar plot to what I showed before here. Once again, this is if you don't get a flood, and here's if you get a flood. Um, these blue stars are the same as what they were in the previous plot, but the red stars are the ones where you have an increased probability of your flood. So it's a 25% chance of getting that flood every year. And what you can see is that if you were looking at these first 10 years without a family record, you might say, okay, both of these had two floods, probably the same distribution. If you looked at this longer period of uh, 15 or 20 years, you might say, wow, there were three floods in this case, and only two in that case. So this other case must be the case where there's a higher probability of flooding. But in reality, that's actually a five-year flood, not a four-year flood. But there's just some randomness in the system. So kind of the, the concluding part of all this is just to note that it can be challenging to detect differences in probability if we're talking about these small probabilities. Um, given a short record, and I put a short in quotes because here I'm just giving you 100 years, and there are some kind of records we have that are, you know, only 40 years, maybe 50 years. So 100 years is actually a pretty good record from our perspective. And just to drive this point home um, one more time, um, this is now showing the function of the length of your record, the average number of events you get per five years. And uh, what you can see is that in this kind of random drive of these events, um, at first you actually have a period where you have more five-year floods than you have four-year floods. Um, whereas as you go to a longer record, you're able to get a more stable estimate of the probability of your events. So essentially, uh, the more that we observe um, something, the more we can understand what this probability is. Um, however, for these shorter records, there's a lot of randomness that we need to keep in mind when we're interpreting changes in extreme events. And before I get into kind of the physics behind heavy precipitation, um, I'll pause if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. that, that last slide you had, um, there was more five-year floods than four-year floods just in that random example that you had with your random number generator, but not always. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. So this is just um, all of this has some randomness, so I could make this plot again. It could look pretty different, except that they would approach kind of these stable estimates on the right. So yeah, sometimes you could have ones that you had more of your higher probability than sometimes not. And I have another question. Sure. Um, the one that shows the stars. So can, yeah. So if we were actually, if we wanted to also look at 100-year floods or 50-year floods or something, they would um, not... Um, these five-year floods would actually, some of them would actually be a 50-year flood, is that true? Yeah, so, so in this case I've grouped, greater, right? exactly, that's another good point. Um, so I just grouped everything kind of, of that probability is higher. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, the question was about um, if we wanted to consider larger flood events, and so larger than just your five-year flood, um, how would those play into this? And the way we find the probability here is just for an event um, that is, say, the top 20% and higher in probability. And so some of these events, instead of being a five-year flood, could be your 100-year flood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what would you need or what would happen to cause an area, either one area or like different areas, to have a five-year or four-year flood? Like, what's the difference between those environments? Yeah, so the question was what actually kind of physically is the difference between places that have a five-year flood and a four-year flood. And I'll actually get into kind of the causes behind extreme precipitation in a second. Um, but it's a couple different things. So some of them are just going to be, um, you know, what weather system you generally have moving over your location and, um, you know, how much rain is likely to drop on you. So that's just going to be a function essentially of local climate. Um, it could have to do also with just how much um, water holding capacity your land has. So places that have more asphalt, um, even if the same amount of precipitation, might be likely to flood more because the asphalt can absorb water the same way like a ground that is mostly dirt could. Um, so yeah, a lot of local effects. Yes? Yes. Um, a lot of it has to do a lot with the construction that, you know, what we're doing now. Like I know it's not to like in California, San Francisco, that you're going deeper down into the caves that they're finding out. And some of them are going down to the bed of the ocean with these big, big, large equipments. And they're trying to figure that they already started to put certain pipelines or different things in to prevent a different flow of the water. Sometimes they couldn't get too down because of the um, 
I think it was the young perception, but something that was was with rock, and then that was interesting. Yeah, but so have, people yeah, have different geologies. Yeah, uh, but they were discussing it about different um, states and different, like San Francisco, Ohio, different places, but not everyone is doing it all at once. So they started these new um, projects that already began. Could that also do, uh, affect us, you know, like from the Northeast or whatever? Um, yeah, I think that you know there are definitely local places can affect other locations' weather. I don't know specifically about um, what you're referring to, but I'd be happy to talk about it later if you wanted to. Any other questions? All right, sounds good. Um, Great, so um, now we're going to get to the question of what actually causes extreme precipitation, and is there a reason to understand, or um, is there a way to interpret why it might be changing or changing climate? So to do that, I'm just going to present kind of two of the basic ingredients for precipitation, but also extreme precipitation. Uh, it's pretty basic. So basically, the first thing you need is just to have enough water vapor in your atmosphere. Of course, if your atmosphere is dry, you can't actually condense water and rain. Um, and in terms of everything from precipitation to extreme precipitation, that's just about how much water vapor do you actually have in the atmosphere. So for an extreme event, you need to have a lot of water vapor available. And the other part is um, upward motion. And so essentially, um, if you have a parcel of air and it has some water vapor in it, you basically want to move it upwards in the atmosphere where it will cool, and then the water vapor will condense to water, and then that leads to rain. And so there are a couple ways to do that. Um, one is, for instance, if you had a mountain, you can move your air parcel up over the mountain um, and cause rain. Um, other ways just through upward convection. Um, and so if we're interested in what causes the changes in extreme precipitation, that will usually depend on um, which component of these two is the limiting factor. So is it that there's not enough water vapor in the atmosphere for extreme precipitation, or is it that you don't have enough upward motion to produce it? Um, and there's reason to believe that it might be the first one, and so I'm going to focus on that in terms of uh, the connection between temperature and the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to present what's kind of um, some basic fundamental physics in our field, um, which is called the positive Hawthorne relationship. And just stick with me for this graph. We have uh, temperature in degrees Celsius on the x-axis, and what's called saturation vapor pressure on the y-axis. Um, don't worry too much about what that actually is, except that it basically equals the amount of water vapor air can hold. And so you might have heard in the news that in a warmer climate, the atmosphere can hold more water vapor. And basically, this is, is what they're talking about. Um, an important part here is that this is actually an exponential relationship. And so the more you increase your temperature, the faster you increase your capacity of your atmosphere to hold water. And so moving back to the observations, uh, the question at hand is, are we actually observing this in the atmosphere? Do we actually see that generally as we're increasing temperature, which is shown here on this lower graph uh, from the 1880s today, um, that we're also seeing increases in water vapor? Now, the reason it's a little bit harder, to request, harder question to answer than the temperature one is that it's just a little bit harder to measure. We haven't measured it for as long. Um, but a recent study in 2007 um, use some modeling um, using these atmospheric uh, models that we use in our research in the yellow, and then observations in the black. Um, to argue that it, it did, did appear that there um, are increases in atmospheric water vapor contents that align relatively well with the change in temperature. And so, based on this recent work, um, it does suggest that we are having um, a greater um, ability for atmosphere to hold water vapor and that that might be a connection to changes in extreme precipitation. Um, so just to summarize, um, high precipitation events can cause uh, human impact through flooding, and um, they do seem to be generally increasing both worldwide and in the US, but there's a large amount of spatial variability. And it can be hard to determine if there are changes in an extreme event given the length of our climate record, and that these are almost by definition low probability events. Uh, getting into the physics, the requirements for heavy precipitation are essentially sufficient water vapor and upward motion in the atmosphere. 
And it does appear that water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing, which is consistent with our understanding of the increases in heavy precipitation that we've observed. And finally, if there are any additional questions, I will take them. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering from observation, not from, you know, because I, we've had torrential rains for a long time, and it seems like it's spring and summer and fall. Um, it seems like we have less of that, but we have these very dramatic skies, and we have a lot of you know, rainbows, double rainbows. <laughs> that, what is, can you explain? Do you understand that kind of stuff, or is that just... So short term. Yes, the question was about trends and extreme rain events as well as kind of skies looking more dramatic or big kind of thunderstorms or rainbows. Um, on the latter question, I, I can't really answer too much on that, although there was a spectacular triple rainbow a couple weeks ago that was very impressive. Um, on the former question, I think one of the hard things about understanding extreme events is that we tend to go heavily by anecdotes, just a natural human. Um, way that we function. So it can seem like, you know, last year we had these crazy rains, but then for the previous 10 years maybe we didn't. Um, so, you know, is that some climate change or not? And I think that's why it's important to think a lot about these, kind of the randomness that I talked about, and like the statistics of these events, in that um, you can have periods that have a drought, you can have periods with extreme rain, um, even if you're not changing the probability of those events, just by the randomness inherent in the climate system. Um, and you can also have trends, of course. And so, that's the power of these records that have measured precipitation for, say, 100 years, is you can look back beyond the time scale of like, human anecdotes and actually say, you know, do we really believe there was this change in precipitation? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if the um, amount of uh, moisture in the air affects tornado formation. Tornadoes are a fascinating question. So the question was about connection between moisture and tornado formation. Um, if you remember Ethan's graph from earlier in the talk, tornadoes are kind of on the not well measured and not well understood side. Um, moisture itself uh, can be important, um, mostly in terms of uh, essentially you need to have certain amounts of instability in your atmosphere to have a tornado. Um, tornadoes often come from big thunderstorms, and you get a big thunderstorm when you have atmospheric instability. And if you have water vapor at low levels in the atmosphere, you're more likely to have that instability. Um, so there potentially is a physical connection. Um, there are a lot of other really important things for tornadoes. Um, for instance, the amount of shear or kind of um, rotation you have in your atmosphere column. And because they're such small scale events, that's why they're very hard to, to study. Um, but yes, there may be a connection there as well. What do you mean by atmospheric? Um, good question. The question is what I mean by atmospheric instability. Um, an atmospheric instability or an unstable atmosphere is essentially one in which the bottom part of your atmosphere is less dense than the upper part. And so if you were to say take a piece of air and it was less dense than the piece of air above it um, and then moved it upwards, essentially it would want to keep going upwards because it was actually lighter than what was on top of it. Um, and so water vapor in air makes the air lighter than if there is no water vapor in the air. And so if you have a lower layer of air that has a bunch of water vapor and upper air that is dry, um, that's unstable because the lower the air is less dense than the upper air. Uh, yeah, sorry. What determines the track of a storm and the low pressure? Um, the question is what determines the track of the storm and the low pressure. If I could answer what determines the track of the storm, I think that the weather service would hire me in front to. Um, <laughs> that one of the challenges in weather forecasting is that uh, tracks of storms are not deterministic. And so when we try to estimate where a storm is going, uh, we often make kind of a, um, we'll <laughs> make a probabilistic estimate of where it could move. Um, however, generally what determines the track of the storm is going to be um, different pressure systems in the atmosphere that will kind of push it one way or the other. Um, and that's just related to kind of general atmospheric motion. Um, you have lows and highs in pressure moving around the atmosphere all the time. And kind of where they are at a given point uh, will help determine the path of the storm. All right, so with that, uh, let's thank our speaker again and move to a five minute break before we go to our third speaker. So thank you again, Karen.
Department of Medical Sciences right here at Harvard Medical School. Um, and with that, I was Roy. I'll turn it over to our final speaker, uh, Andy. Thank you. All right. Uh, Hello everyone. I'm Andy Rice. Uh, I'm also a graduate student uh, working with Peter Hybers with the here. Um, and I study uh, moisture transport in the atmosphere and how that interacts with uh, climate and how it influences climate variability both for the modern uh, and also looking deep into the past, sort of over the last ice age, thousands of years ago. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about heat waves and droughts, um, which are a particular kind of extreme weather. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, three aspects tonight of heat waves. First, we'll kind of build up a picture of what's a recipe what ingredients are necessary uh, in order to create hot weather? Uh, what are the physical ingredients that go into that? Then we'll talk a little bit about the observations and statistics of the uh, and kind of ask questions about uh, where they occur most, uh, and then also how often do they occur, and are their frequencies changing in time? And then related to their frequencies, uh, we'll also look into whether heat waves and the trends in the number of heat waves we're getting and the types of events are related to climate change. So something that Ethan mentioned um, in his talk is that it's really important to consider the context uh, of what system you're worrying about when talking about heat waves. So a uh, heat wave for crops is very different from a heat wave for people. Uh, and that's because uh, different uh, human or ecological systems are, are dependent on different things, like people worry more about humidity than they do about precipitation. Um, but the common element in all of these is, uh, in every heat wave, surface temperature is really important. So we're going to talk about the factors that control surface temperature. Uh, and first and foremost here, uh, solar radiation is the thing that provides energy to the entire Earth system. And so that arrives at the top of the atmosphere with about 1,300 watts per square meter of energy. Um, and it turns out that only a small fraction of that makes it down to the ground. And so that turns out to be a, a really important control on how high temperatures you can get. So why do we not get that full amount of 1,300, square, uh, 1300 watts per square meter? On its way down, two things happen. First, 
the atmosphere is not actually totally transparent to visible light. And so a sizable fraction of that light is absorbed directly in the atmosphere. So it never makes it down to the surface because of that. And secondly, you have a lot of clouds over much of the Earth. Uh, clouds are light. And when you look down on them from space, you see they're, they're white from up there, too. And what you're really seeing is reflected sunlight. So that's another large component of the entire solar budget that's going to um, reducing the amount of solar radiation that makes it to the surface. And then once you get to the surface, a similar thing happens again. Um, and that's that the, uh, the color of the surface, it's often called the albedo, um, has a big impact on how much the light is reflected versus how much is absorbed. So a surface that's made of snow or an ice sheet um, has a very different reflectivity or albedo than um, something like dirt or, uh, or grass, which is darker and will absorb more. And then there's a the last uh, element of, of the solar radiation part of the equation, which is that uh, you notice you know, heat waves really happen in the summer, not in the winter. The main reason for that is that the sun is overhead for longer during the day, and it's more directly overhead. So all of these things are kind of working together to give you more solar radiation under certain conditions. Um, and that's really the primary control. So once the light gets to the surface, uh, what does it do? What, what happens to that energy? Um, it can turn directly into heat um, when it's absorbed. But one of the other things that happens that, that turns out to be a really important control on surface temperature is that energy can go to evaporating soil moisture. So there's a lot of um, water that's absorbed by the soil, say, during the uh, winter and spring when you get rainfall in a lot of places. And so I'm showing that here. Sorry, just a little bit. Hard to see those thin lights. the light. So um, the, the dark soil here, um, I'm thinking of as, as being kind of saturated with lots of rainfall from the, from the rainfall during the spring. And as the sun bears down on that over time, what you do is evaporate a lot of that soil moisture. Um, and that's going both through direct evaporation of the soil and also through plants that are using it to survive. And so what can happen over time is that if you have a long duration with no rain and lots of sunlight in the summer, you can desiccate the soil through that large amount of evaporation. And if you go kind of too far here, you'll deplete the, all of the soil moisture, um, and you're left with this very dry earth, which can uh, then heat up very quickly because it's no longer buffered uh, by this, uh, this water that's present there. Um, and as soon as you hit that threshold, you can actually have a very dramatic increase in temperatures. Um, as you know, if you ever boil a pot of water, it takes a huge amount of energy to turn uh, liquid water into water vapor. Uh, and so, so as soon as you lose that buffering capacity, uh, it really changes things. Um, but we also should keep in mind that not every place starts out with lots of soil moisture. Um, and there are many places, even just in the U.S., that begin as desert that never really have soil moisture to begin with. And you can see in regions like that that the plants are more adapted to having uh, conditions where they typically don't have water. And so kind of the nature of the heat waves that you'll get in a given area will be very dependent on what your initial conditions are here. So at the beginning of the summer, do you start here or do you start out here? And if you're in the southwest, for example, it's very easy to um, start out the summer and very quickly get high temperatures. Whereas um, here in Boston, often you start out with a lot of uh, absorbed water. And it turns out that we also have uh, another way of kind of indirectly controlling um, how um, both albedo, that's the reflectivity, and the soil moisture um, can alter our, our temperatures in, in areas that we inhabit. And so we can kind of see that looking at two examples. The first one, so imagine you have a forest and you replace it with a parking lot with lots of blacktop. So this is two things, and Karen mentioned this briefly. Um, if you have a blacktop, asphalt, um, it's very dark, and so it's very low reflectivity. So that'll absorb a lot of radiation, um, uh, much more so than, than any trees or something like that. And then secondly, it's almost completely impermeable. Asphalt doesn't absorb any water. Uh, and so instead of having soil that's taking water and then releasing it over slowly over a period of time, that's all running straight off of the storm drains and draining somewhere else. And so in the summer, uh, a parking lot like this would potentially get very hot. We can compare that to another type of land service that would need a change from its natural state, which would be farmland. 
And if you were actually the changes in reflectivity and in porosity would not be nearly as significant because uh, not only are there still plants which are similar to other possibly to the original vegetation, but we're actually actively tilling the soil and conditioning it to be able to hold lots of moisture. Um, and in many places we're also very A. And so um, depending on the land use, you'll actually get very different conditions in terms of the susceptibility to track conditions or extreme heat waves. And this creates an interesting um, phenomenon known as the urban heat island, where uh, cities are almost always considerably warmer in the summer than the surrounding countryside. And it's really because of these two effects. And that may be part of the reason, for example, why in Europe um, the heat waves in 2003 and 2010 were so much more severe is that people there typically live in very dense urban areas. Um, in, addition, in addition to not having air conditioning, um, those areas can be very large. And so you build up uh, large areas that have no relief in the form of soil moisture. So there's one last uh, ingredient here that I want to talk about, which is um, control of surface temperature by winds, and just kind of normal weather. So for much of the year, um, the jet stream blows from west to east across the continent. And it's much stronger in winter. It's very the, the jet kind of stays relatively fixed then. Um, in the summer, it meanders a little bit, but still, on average, you have air flowing from west to east over the continent. But in the summer, it's also possible to break that pattern down very easily. And you get these high pressure systems very frequently in the central US and the southwest. Um, where you kind of build up a region of hot, of hot air. Um, and that system creates what's often called a heat pan, where it's, a, it's this pressure surface that's expanding as it heats up. And that's actually able to divert the flow of the jet stream around it and block that flow. And so that, that does two things. The first is it prevents that, say, cool air from the ocean, which stays relatively constant temperature, prevents it from getting into the region to cool it off but also it prevents water vapor from getting there. And so you have no um, relief in the form of rainfall. Um, so these heat domes can kind of lead to a positive feedback where they get very hot, which diverts the flow. And because they don't have any rainfall and don't have any relief from um, cool winds, they actually get hotter and more able to block the gas stream. So that's kind of the characteristic way that you can develop a severe drought in the US. So in a moment, I'll take questions. But first, I want to show you an animation of what one of these actually looks like. So before I play it, let me just explain for a minute what we're looking at here. So this is 1995 in July. And I'm just going to play a 20-day animation. And what we're showing here in the arrows are the winds in the lower to mid-atmosphere. And then the colors represent how thick the lower atmosphere is. So that's kind of the heat dome, is where there's a big red blob. And that's directly related to the thickness of that layer and to the temperature. So you can think of red as being hot and lighter colors like green as being cool. And so I'll just play through this. And what you'll see is that this heat dome will form over the southwest. And you can see it pulsing on and off. And that's the diurnal cycle going from day to night. So it heats up during the day, cools off a little bit at night, builds up here. And then what it's going to do on the 13th of July is pass over Chicago. And then it sort of dissipates. And this will move back around so you can see it again. Um, and this is really interesting that because um, it didn't really do much to anyone in the southwest uh, or in the southern US, despite being this big red blob. And yet when this pass over Chicago, it killed 700 people. Um, so it kind of highlights the issue of how do you measure extreme? Um, and here it's really clear, actually, that people in Chicago are actually less well adapted to people. So they have these events less frequently than people in the South. There's also an issue of population density. There are far more people in the Chicago and the Midwest than, than there are in the South, Southwest. But um, at the same time, um, there is a preparedness issue. And in places where you regularly get these types of events, people will usually have preparedness or other ways of dealing with it. So we'll take a quick break for uh, questions here for a minute before diving into the more observation. Something to me that you just showed um, the 
Yeah, so that's, uh, I made that from, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. So the question is how, how is the movie um, with all the winds uh, and the, the heat domes generated? So we have kind of point-wise observations from all over here. So in the US, there are actually lots of weather stations all over the country, thousands of them. We also send up balloons that profile the entire atmosphere. Uh, and then we have satellites that look down, uh, and they measure uh, temperature, water vapor, all these things. And then to make a, a big map like this, we actually have to put it into what's called a, a data assimilation model. It's like a, it's what's used for weather forecasting, basically. And it takes all the observations and then uses what we know about the physics to combine that to give us the best estimate of what the state of the atmosphere is. Um, and so that model then outputs the entire global fields of temperature and humidity and everything else. Um, and so I've just taken all that data, which we'll show you in the tutorial, by the way, how to get this kind of data and look at it for yourself. Um, but I just downloaded it and, and plotted it together um, and put it into movie. <laughs> yeah? So a little confused on how that heat dome moved. The way you describe it, it seems like it should take a little time to fill the heat dome. But it seems like at night it kind of goes away. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's very complicated, and actually it's um, not that unusual for it to form in the southwest. And, and often there will be kind of a persistent one that just will try and pause it on a good spot, um, like this. So in this time of the summer in July, that's a pretty normal situation in the southwest. And what's really unusual is that somehow the wind field managed to nudge that out and carry it all the way over to Chicago, where it had more of an impact. Um, and the dynamics of how that happens are actually very complicated and not easy to predict. Yeah. Um, I think maybe part of the one who's asking is of what, how it is to it go away at night and mm. it comes back to the day. Yeah, so that, that is a new, so the question is, is, is really, uh, I guess, yeah, why, why does the heat dome kind of flash on and off? Why does it pulsate? And that's mostly to do with the solar radiation, actually. That at night, it's, it's always going to cool off a little bit. Um, and then during the day, it picks up again as it gets more radiation. Um, and then it can continue to grow bigger and bigger, even though it's decreasing at night, because that region still hasn't gotten any water vapor to say make clouds that would block some of the sunlight. Yeah? I think in a summer, I always hear this talking about Bermuda highs. Is that sort of another kind of veto? Um, yeah, so, so high pressure systems happen all over the world, and there are lots of. Um, Lots of them that occur very regularly in certain times of the year. Um, and, and I think you know, the Bermuda High doesn't have as much to do with uh, heat over land since that's happening over the ocean. Um, so there are probably some different dynamics involved there. But they certainly all affect the weather systems in similar ways and causing uh, other, uh, other movements of the jet stream. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. The question is, um, why is the jet stream stronger in the winter than it is in the summer? Um, one of the reasons is that the, the jet stream is really driven by the temperature difference between uh, the north and the south. And in the winter, you turn out the lights in the north. So the North Pole actually has no light in the middle of the winter. So it's very cold. And what's happening is the rest of the world is um, pushing energy up towards the north. It's trying to mix it and homogenize it. Um, and in the process, it actually creates this jet. So when there's a bigger temperature difference from north to south, it strengthens it. And then when the sun's over kind of the U.S. during the summer, that temperature difference is in its way. Yeah. Vito Y, it always goes, you know, west and east. Is it, is it the Earth's rotation? Yeah, exactly. It's, yes. The, the, the question is why does it go from west to east? Yeah, and in the, uh, it's, it's almost entirely the Earth's rotation. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I think we should probably move on for now, um, and we'll get a, a chance for some more questions uh, after this session, or after this section. So let's jump right back in and look at some data, some actual observations. Um, I'm going to show some plots, some maps here of drought severity. Um, these are some of the some that Ethan showed earlier. And what I'm showing here is uh, the Drought severity index, and this is again a measure of how much precipitation has occurred and also what's the temperature over a, a month, a period of a month. 
And the color scale here goes from the dark reds are extreme drought, and then going back to green is extremely moist, and white means kind of average conditions. Uh, and this is during the Dust Bowl in the 30s. It's one of the more severe uh, events during that period, and it's, it's kind of this decade where there was just drought after drought after drought with kind of no relief for a lot of farmers in the Midwest. And so there are a lot of iconic photos of um, you know, farms just completely covered by dust, um, total crop failure or large regions in the U.S. Um, because of the sensitivity of the plants to uh, not getting precipitation and, and also the high temperatures. And we can compare that to a drought from just last year. Um, and they actually don't look all that different. There's some common patterns we can see. So maybe by looking at these two, we can try and identify some regions that get drought more easily and think about why that is. Um, so this is July of last year. Um, and, and I think the, the common patterns you see here are that um, around the coastal regions, both, both on the west coast and the east coast, um, you seem to be less likely to get very severe droughts. And there's some exceptions. Like the most recent one, Southern California, had a bigger drought. Um, and, and down in Florida, there's some bigger drought. But typically, the middle of the country seems to be more susceptible. Um, and the simplest explanation for that is, is really that uh, when you're close to the ocean, it's much easier for something like a heat dome, uh, one of these high pressure systems, to be disrupted by a brief rainstorm or a brief sea breeze that, that cools you off. Whereas in the middle of the country, all of your neighbors are just like you. They're dry, um, maybe they haven't had rain for a while, and so it's easy to build up these heat domes that kind of sit there and persist and build up over time. And so a question that often comes up in this topic is, are droughts changing in time? Are they getting more severe? Are they getting more frequent? Um, and the data for this are actually not great. Um, as Karen showed, we really don't have that great of observations in much of the world for precipitation in particular. Um, but this map is, is attempting to look at that question anyways. Um, and it's showing the trend in the drought severity index from 1950 to 2011. And so redder means um, more severe droughts, and blue means less severe droughts. And you'll notice there are some uh, dashed lines here. And the lines are um, over regions where the trend in the drought is large enough to detect. It's statistic <coughs> excuse me, statistically significant uh, against the noise um, that is the normal year-to-year -year variations that occur in these places. And what you see here is that although there are some places that have uh, statistically significant trends, like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, East Asia, and a few spots here and there, say in the U.S. or in Western Australia. You know, there are a few places where this is significant. Over much of the world, it, is, it isn't. And if you actually average this map, average the color over the entire world, you get an answer that's not very different from zero. And so, from the data we have, at least, there's not much of an indication of there being a change in drafts. Which seems a little strange because we know the world's getting warmer, so why is that? And the one possible answer, though this isn't the only answer, is uh, something again that Karen mentioned, which is that when you change temperature, you also change the type of rainfall that you get. And so in some of these regions that are warmer, you're also getting more precipitation. And so as you're able to build up soil moisture, uh, those higher temperatures may be offset somewhat by the ability to um, handle them by having more water in the ground. But what about people? So droughts are really more relevant to plants and crops, um, but people respond to different things. Um, in particular, uh, the, the main effects for us are temperature and then also humidity. And if you look at that, trends in the number of heat wave days per year is defined by the heat index that you can show. Um, and these are just the number of days that are defined as extremely high temperatures. Um, what we find is that almost everywhere where we have data, regions where we don't have data are, are gray here. Um, everywhere where we have data, the trends are, are more or less always either zero or positive. And when you average over all of them, you get a number that's actually quite positive. And so that in places like Western Europe, you're actually seeing about three or four extra very hot days every summer. 
And you can contrast that with some places like the eastern US where there doesn't appear to be much of a trend. Um, part of that is the weather here is actually very variable compared to some places like Europe. And, and so there's not uh, a way of statistically significantly determining whether they're changing or not, just because things change a lot here normally. But so again, this highlights the, the problem that when you're talking about heat waves, if we go back to the draft picture, it looks very different from the one that's relevant to people, and so you really have to define uh, what's the important measure of the heat wave for a given situation before looking at the data. So just to wrap things up here, um, I want to bring this back to climate change a little bit. So climate's a, a very difficult thing to predict. Weather is also very difficult to predict. But one of the things that we're fairly certain about that we really know is happening is that the Earth's temperature on average is increasing. And so if we go back to the dice example that Ethan talked about, um, that would be kind of like adding a single uh, number, just adding one to every face of the dice so that you shift the distribution up upwards. And so looking at that in terms of the temperature distribution here, you would go from a reference climate in the solid line uh, up to one that's just been shifted to the right a little bit in this dash line. And so even if you shift the distribution a tiny bit, the interesting thing is that when you go out into the scales of the distribution, these extreme events, you see you get a, a much greater frequency of extreme hot weather events, um, even with this tiny shift. Uh, and going along with that, you would actually get uh, far fewer cold events. So that's if you just add a little bit to the average. But that's not the only thing that could happen. Um, equally, you could keep the same average but make things more variable just widening the distribution and spreading it out. Now in this case, you'd expect to see more extreme hot weather and also much more extreme cold weather. And then finally, instead of kind of just moving around a fixed shape, you could actually change the shape of the distribution. And you can imagine doing this by, um, say, drying out the soil in a way that hasn't been seen before, but keeping kind of the cold weather the same as it is today. There are all kinds of scenarios where this could happen or where, where the opposite situation could happen. But the point is simply that um, with subtle changes in the distribution, you actually get really big changes in the frequency of these extreme events, largely because they are extreme. And so distinguishing between these different scenarios and trying to figure out um, whether extremes are changing or not is one of the central areas of research in, in, in climate science, and that's um, a large part of what we're trying to do. So to summarize, what have we learned about heat waves? Right. Um, first, we build up a recipe for extremely hot weather. Um, namely, we need high solar radiation, which you can get by having a lot of sunlight, but also having few clouds, or having a, a dark surface that can absorb it. Um, also, by having low soil moisture, so that you lose that buffering capacity against uh, incoming energy. Uh, and then lastly, having weather conditions that allow that to persist over time. We also saw that heat waves are more common in some places than others. Um, and the pattern, at least in the US, is that uh, being away from the ocean and being in a place that they can't hold much soil moisture or doesn't have much to begin with um, are good ways to get more heat waves or more severe heat waves or droughts. And then looking at trends in heat waves and droughts, we saw that heat waves are becoming more common in some places um, and less common in others. And there's a lot of spatial variability in that. Um, and also, there's a lot of variability depending on what metric you're using. So whether you're worried about crops or if you're concerned about human impacts, you, you often get different answers. So with that, I'll take questions before going to our group summary. Um, if anyone has, has questions specifically on you guys. Sure. I'm sort of shocked by how little we seem to know about the entire southern hemisphere, except for Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, so do we really have no idea if there are heat waves in South America? Yeah, so the question is, yeah, well, why do we know so little about the Southern Hemisphere, which is a really excellent question. Um, let me just go back to that map. Um, it's essentially a data density issue. And the, the problem is that you need a very long record to determine whether things are changing or not. And um, the number of observations in South America and Africa, um, and also you can see uh, Antarctica here, there are very few. Um, and so when you want to come up with a spatial average, uh, there just isn't enough data to do it for those regions. 
um, at least not using instrumental data from the ground. Um, you can use satellites to get at some things, but uh, they're kind of, they give you a more blurry picture, um, and it's less accurate over the ground. And so, so when you're dealing with very high temperatures, um, usually you want to stick with actual thermometer observations from, from near the surface. And those are really limited to like the US and Europe and Russia. Um, you know, there, there are 88,000 temperature stations that are giving daily measurements, um, and almost all of them are you know, in the US, Western Europe, um, and then they're just scattered in a few others elsewhere, but there are big biases in where the data come from. Yeah. Should scientists assume that similar things are happening in the Southern Hemisphere, or do you just assume you really don't know? Yeah, I mean, um, we have some information about it. Um, yeah, so, so you have to make some assumptions if you want to come up with a global average. And so one way to do that is to use whatever, whatever observations are available. And what's, what's shown in this plot is just places that have really good observations. So that's part of it. So you can use the observations that are more sparse. Um, but you can also run climate models um, and uh, you know, do lots of other things. You can look at ecological changes as kind of a proxy for what's been changing. That's, that's another way of doing it. Um, yeah. Of those three uh, graphs that you showed with temperature and, and the shift, which of those three best fit the data from the last hundred years? Yeah. For example, in the United States. Yeah, so, so I've done some work on this, um, and there's been a lot of discussion, uh, especially in the press, about um, the idea that climate is becoming more variable. Um, and it would be more difficult, actually, to detect this than to detect this scenario of having a changing average. Um, and it turns out that if, if you look globally, which is the, the place where we can be most certain about things, is if you take all the data. Um, if you look globally, everything is, is fairly consistent with taking a changing average. When, when you're talking about the global average picture, when you look regionally, there are definitely areas where you can see that there's a changing shape to the distribution. And so if you look just within the US, um, there are changes in variability um, that are distinct from the global average. So the second one matches the United States? Um, partly. I'd say the, the, some combination of all of them is happening in the US. Um, but even within the US, uh, it's, it's regional. So the West Coast versus the East Coast, um, you see different responses. Yeah. Um, I have a question from someone watching on the live stream, uh, Jude from Cambridge. She's interested in the um, Dust Bowl of the 1920s mm -hmm. and whether the heat dome created the Dust Bowl or did the Dust Bowl create the uh, heat dome? Yeah, so yeah, the, the question from, uh, from the internet is about uh, whether the, the Dust Bowl was created by, the heat, by heat domes or if um, the Dust Bowl actually generates those heat domes. Uh, and it's kind of a chicken or egg question. It's interesting. I mean, this is, we deal with this a lot in climate. Um, you don't always have the ability to actually distinguish between the two. And part of that is because I mentioned this notion of feedbacks, where once you start a heat wave event, it's possible that that heat wave event intensifies itself. Um, and so deciding where you say it started becomes important in, in choosing you know, what caused what. So, so often it's very difficult to get into the causation with single events like that. Um, and, and during the Dust Bowl, there's a lot of evidence that, that there were feedbacks like that at play um, with lots of, lots of different factors affecting each other. So it's, it's a very um, interesting and open question that people are studying. The um, uh, previous slide on drones was uh, the white area is uh, uh, here. You mean? Yeah. 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 Is white no data? Um, so that's that's a good question. Um, the, the question is on, on the draft slide. Does white mean no data? Um, I'm trying to remember. I've read this paper, but uh, <laughs> it, so yeah. So, Africa is just a looks yeah. Uh, so so it's it. it Probably is not just data because right, this is the Sahara, um, and part of it is that the stratosphere index really only makes sense if you have vegetation and you have soil, and so they may simply not be estimating it there because well, first of all, there's no precipitation there, um, very little precipitation, uh, and secondly, you get very little vegetation. And, and in Central Australia, similarly, you have very drought-like conditions almost as the norm. Um, I'm actually a little surprised there isn't more, more white area there. The, so, the red at the border there simply says the desert is moving. 
Yeah, that could be one interpretation of it, certainly, yeah. <laughs> okay. On the other map, mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, this one, what is that white area in the middle of the U.S.? Yeah, so the question is on the uh, on the heat index map, what is the white area inside the U.S.? Um, if you look at the color scale here, it's from, from blue to red. And so actually, the regions that are white and not gray are areas where um, the, the change is very small. There may be a lot of noise around the change. You know, one year might be very large, another year might be very small. But over time, that doesn't appear to be increasing or decreasing. What can we do to try to reverse it? Because I was wondering, since we've been going out of space and it made a lot of changes in our environment. Yeah, so, so, so what can we do to, to stop drives from happening? Yeah, yeah um, there are a lot of things. And it, it's, it's difficult because uh, you know, weather and climate are powerful engines. So if you think about a hurricane, a single person, whatever they want to do, isn't going to stop it um, <laughs> once it's started. Uh, but for things like droughts, you know, a lot of land management becomes important for that. You know, deforestation, for example, can have a big effect on on soil properties and on moisture retention. Um, urbanization as well. And so, just um, yeah, thinking about uh, how land use uh, changes are made is one way, and that's that's doing it on a very local level. Doing it on a global level, um, you know, we're not actually really modifying the surface for most of the year. Um, so. Um, you know, it's, it's not obvious uh, exactly how one could, could change things deliberately, but, but that is a question that people have looked into as to how can we kind of modify the environment in order to make it uh, less extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a collective question for all three of these. Uh, a scientist, you look at the data, it's mm -hmm. a lot less speculative. So my question is, what do you think we'll know in 20 years? Mm -hmm. and what, what would you hope to affect in policy change given that our policy tends to go through a political way. Yeah, so the question is, what, yeah, what, what would we hope to be able to do in 20 years? Um, and um, in, yeah, in terms of policy changes themselves, um, I'm not sure. I think you know, the political system is almost as noisy as weather. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of the scientific um, body of knowledge, uh, I think there are a number of things that can be done. Firstly, I think uh, improving the observational record so that we can actually answer these questions. We saw in a lot of these plots the limitation is the data. Not having rain gauges in all of Africa when you know it's a simple plastic thing, right? We should be able to put those everywhere. Um, if we can do that and keep them in the same place and keep the measurements coming in for periods like 20 years, then you can start to get good enough statistics to be able to answer these questions. And be able to say, you know, here's a definite case where the data appear to support um, that there are changes there. Um, and so, so just having the data um, being more developed in 20 years is what I would vote for personally. But maybe, maybe you guys can speak to that too. I don't know. I was going to add that it's not just about adding new systems, but often just maintaining some of the observation systems that we already have in place. So weather observation satellites just went offline because of budget cuts. Um, I don't remember how many we lost, but you know, the challenge isn't just building new resources, but maintaining what we've already got. Yeah. Maybe this is a good uh, segue actually to move to the, the group uh, questions and our group summary. Um, so do you guys want to just come on? Yeah. Is it going to be too late in 20 years to Some of them. <laughs> it's hard to say exactly which ones, but um, yeah. But yeah, why don't, why don't we just run through our, our group summary here really quickly, and then um, then we can move on to more questions. Sure, okay. So what I wanted you guys to take away from the impact section was that extreme events are one of the dominant sources of damage to society, <laughs> um, and recently. The trends in those standards have been increasing. Um, and then we looked briefly at extreme precipitation as a measure of storminess. And uh, hopefully, you guys understood that we are measuring it in many places, not so well in other places. Um, there do seem to be trends in that. 
uh, to precipitation. They can be hard to interpret, but there are physical reasons to believe we will have increases in extreme precipitation in the warming world. All right, and I talked about heat waves um, and how they're related to climate change. And um, the main conclusion that uh, well, for you can away from uh, this way is that by most measures, they're, they're increasing in frequency um, in, in the ways that we care about. Um, in the global average, that can be hard to detect. Um, but given what we know about climate, they're, they're really expected to continue to continue that trend upward with time. Um, and so now we can just um, have our, our general discussion. I want to make a quick plug for um, after this, we're going to do a, a quick kind of tutorial workshop where we'll show you a bunch of links uh, to web resources where you can look at climate data and weather data for yourself. Um, make movies like the one I made um, and, and kind of check things out, see what's out there um, from lots of different resources. And it's almost anything you're interested in from an a Earth observing point of view, um, what we can talk about. And if you can't stay for that tutorial that I contested um, on the back of our handout where it says Mix to Learn More, um, there's a tiny URL link to the document which has all of the links that we'll be looking at in that workshop. Um, so people often, you know, they say, how do we know that climate change is happening or we want to look at the data and like it actually is really easy to do this on your browser. So to go look at this and see their way. Thank you. And at this point, um, you can have with the speakers, and then five or ten minutes for the start of the um, data tutorial. in areas where there are high the, the population density is not as high. I mean nobody lives in the middle of the desert it's in Australia. And it's like that part of Mongolia compared to my whole point being 
people don't necessarily as notice that as much, hence the policy changes aren't influenced as much. Is that a fair statement to make? Um, I wouldn't say that we saw this map. I mean, if you look like the Middle East, if you look at Europe, yeah, uh, you look bizarre. at like basically Eastern Europe, Western Russia, yeah. there's a lot there. So yeah, like Siberia, there's not a lot there. Nobody lives there. Um, but there have kind of been some interesting like, societal studies saying that the more people experience extreme weather, the more they yeah. care about climate change. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. there's interesting, like, like, you know, is it better if people experience extreme weather? Right. They will pass yeah, they would just, yeah, you know, just learn the lesson and yeah. just do something about it. Yeah. And yeah. The, 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 the squiggly the lines are supposed to be one example. It is significant. So oh, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. There's just there's no way to say 
and then you use a line them up and write it in you know, where both the models are good and producing some things. And well, obviously, um, generating form. So, the, none of them would be particularly easy. No, right? So, it would be kind of statistics. Exactly. But the statistics part, but I think Start it, but yeah, feel free to tell me what to do. <laughs> All right, so um, we're just going to walk you guys through um, this. Some of these links that we provided, and they're in this Google document. If you look on the back of the handout, there's a link to it, so you can um, click the links as opposed to having to type the full address. Um, but we thought we'd just collect together a number of resources for looking at weather and climate data, um, because there are a lot of them. 
that are that are easy to get to and use on the internet. Um, so we've divided this by different subsections. So so first, weather data and forecasts. So those are more kind of short term. You know, what's going to happen in the next week, sort of questions. Uh, and that'll also let you look at satellite imagery. And I'll click some of these links in a minute. But I've also um, put some screenshots from each of the websites uh, next, uh, just below each of the links. Um, next, there's a section on observations of weather extremes. And so these are looking at trends um, for individual places. So you can look, you know, what's the closest station to my house? And ask questions like, how are the heat index days changing with time? Um, and you can plot that for almost any uh, of the indices we've talked about, like the drive, uh, severity index or or in this case, uh, this is uh, frequency of warm days that I'm looking at here. So you can look at that all over the world. And that's actually a collection that has almost every observation that's ever been taken of temperature. Uh, it goes into that. Um, then we have a section on historical climate observations. So um, the National Climate Data Center viewer here um, is a wonderful tool that lets you look at everything from droughts to hurricanes um, um, to sea ice and, and storms and flooding uh, and lets you very easily make these kinds of maps uh, and look at different events and also trends in time. Um, and then the National Snow and Ice Data Center also has some, some excellent um, graphics on looking at changes in sea ice if you're interested in the cryosphere. And then the last two sections, um, we have climate model forecasts. So this is stepping away from observations. Um, looking at maps of what the IPCC models project to be the changes we're likely to see in the future. Uh, and the neat thing about this tool is that you can um, look globally, but you can also select a scenario because we don't know what people are going to do for the next 100 years, say. We don't know how many more tons of CO2 will be em emitted into the atmosphere. And so what the, the IPCC has done is to run lots of different scenarios um, that correspond to increasing emissions or keeping emissions fairly stable or even decreasing emissions. And you can compare um, what that would do to temperature over time um, in those different scenarios. Um, and you can also look at it for precipitation. So it has all of these um, maps you can look at. Um, and, and you can also, again, look locally um, and see what a climate model say, whether is, uh, you know, what, what is the average temperature going to be like in July in 2080 in Boston if we continue to emit at this rate. <laughs> and then last, we have some land use data. Um, the first is uh, the US Geological Survey um, national map, which is, is like the climate data viewer, um, but lets you plot land use on a very fine scale. So you can look down to the scale of a block, you know, whether something is, is urbanized or if it's um, you know, farmland or if it's natural forest. Um, and you can also look at uh, flooding plains uh, at lots of hydrologic data from the water cycle. Um, it's a very nice data viewer. And then the last one here is this uh, NASA page on uh, Landsat, which is a satellite that's been observing land use and soil moisture uh, for a long time and has some amazing animations uh, of essentially terraforming. Um, this is a screenshot from one of the movies for Saudi Arabia where this entire region um, it used to be just desert, has been completely irrigated and turned into farmland over time. And so this is from 2000, and if you look at 2010, it's now even more green. Uh, and you can look at some of those movies. I yeah? Heard yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. They've, they've started uh, basically doing desalination, where you more or less, uh, you're separating salt from water. So they, they take ocean water and turn it into fresh water now, um, which you can do if you have enough uh, energy to, uh, to, you know, in some cases, actually literally boil that water and then recondense the steam into fresh water. But also, you do kind of chemical separations. But however you do it, it's very energy intensive. And so it involves burning a lot of oil to get the fresh water, which um, is, is very expensive. Yeah. Maybe ultimately have to productive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's such an example of increasing rates of kind of deep water and like the same oil and all these other things. And, and there's huge high in the way to get high in the way we can take care of what we took our food and water and increasing the other things that we have to do. Yeah. Yeah, for some regions. So, yeah. Has anyone done any research on trying to make more saline resistant plants so that they could be irrigated in the future? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, I mean, 
finding crops that can grow in hardier environments is a pretty active area of research in general. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not seaweed though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering what amount of those that you just showed are just U.S. data? Mm. What amount are Most of them are global. global? Yeah. Even though they're U.S. geologists. Yeah, the, the USGS one is actually just the U.S., um, mostly just because the, it's a government agency, so that's their jurisdiction. But um, most of the others are global. Landsat here, NASA observes that stuff globally. Um, all of the model runs are global. And then many of the weather things are also global, um, although often you have better data in the US um, regardless of that. Yeah. You may wonder why we can show a bunch of global data sets and then we were complaining about not enough data or maintaining it yeah. because these are going to be shorter time series, right? Yeah. Only, most of them are available for the satellite era. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, should we click through a few links just to show how this, this works? So, um, and then we can also, if you guys yeah. have preferences on some of these yeah. you'd like to look at, we can we can access whichever one sort of piques your attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to see how you can create maps with certain types. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Why don't I go to um, the climate and weather data visualizations page from the University of Maine? It's called the Climate Reanalyzer. Um, so this is a great place to go if you want to create or look at maps or animations of weather or climate from, from the past and also looking at forecasts. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, let's look at, really quickly, um, here is a world map of the um, forecast temperature for the next uh, seven days. And you can just go in and animate it. You can see um, the flashing red Right, that's um, that's the day-night cycle happening. So we're looking at uh, snapshots every three hours here, uh, and the arrows again are, are wind vectors, um, and you can see time going by at the top there. So this is, uh, I guess, about a week from now now. Yeah, and um, and you can change the region, so we don't have to look at it globally. We could just say look at the eastern U.S. Um, and we can just step through. Oops step through these times and see as we go in increments of three hours what the weather models are predicting in terms of the temperature next week. Um, equally, we could say let's look at um, precipitation. Right, so here's forecasts of precipitation. Looks pretty good right now. I don't think we need umbrellas for at least the next day, maybe, if I'm reading the color scale right. <laughs> um, and then at this website, you can also, uh, so that's a weather forecast, but you can also look at, um, for example, we go into the animation gallery. You can look at the, the seasonal cycle of temperature. So this is over the year how the average temperature changes. So this is much longer time scales. I guess this is going in increments of about uh, a week at a time, whereas the last animation was every three hours. So you can see as the sun moves, north and then back down south, the, the temperature distribution kind of follows with it. Uh, and there's, there's your seasons right there. Um, you can dig that up. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure if this particular website has that. Um, but yeah, you can often go and compare observations with, with the weather model output. It usually takes some more work to, to do that, but yeah. And weather forecasts are usually not very good beyond about 10 days. Um, they're much better in kind of the one to three day range, and it just is all downhill from there because it's very difficult to predict exactly where 
you know, where a given cloud is going to be, for example. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's um, yeah. It, that's uh, if any of you went to the chaos talk um, last, I think it was last week. Um, they, they talked about how uh, weather is kind of this fundamentally unpredictable thing on long timescales because tiny changes in your initial conditions will lead to exponential growth of those differences over time. Yeah. Um, so why don't we look at a different one? Um, does anyone else have a preference for something they'd like to look at? Oh, the last. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's look at that. That's exciting. Uh, where did where was that? Uh, okay, animation gallery. Yeah. The last thing I have to mention is about twenty-one thousand years ago, and so we can see models based on. Yeah, and you, you'll notice it's a lot colder. I, they may have changed the color bar. I'm not sure, actually. But, um, yeah, one, the interesting thing about the last glacial is we know a lot about where ice sheets were, for example. So the whole area that's turning pink over North America and actually anywhere that's blue there, basically all of Canada down to more or less where we are here was covered with, like, three kilometers of ice. Uh, this amazingly different climate from where we are now. Um, and it just generated a completely different um, seasonal cycle everywhere um, and, and would not have been a nice time to live in Boston. Yeah. You could live above Boston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there anything about the whole um, deep ocean conveyor belt and hmm. how that affects weather and how that changes the weather? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a movie that some of you guys might have seen, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, where the scenario is is that uh, the the North uh, North Atlantic Ocean thermohaline circulation um, suddenly shuts down in this movie, and and everything goes into a deep freeze, uh, and and if, if it really did shut down, you know, actually you would get much colder temperatures because the ocean is one of the ways that heat's carried towards the pole. So if you were to turn off that circulation, it would get colder. Um, but there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of debate over whether that could actually happen. Um, it doesn't seem to be, um, you know, most of the ocean models that are um, kind of using just the physics of, of fluid mechanics to study how the ocean works, um, don't very easily just turn off. Um, and so it's mostly, the circulation is mostly wind driven. And so you'd have to come up with a very fancy scenario to adjust the winds in just the right way to kind of slow things down. Yeah. Other places could get hotter because they're heated. Yeah. It's actually not obvious exactly what would happen with the atmosphere. Like, I can see you, but the atmosphere does most of the heat and transport work. And it seems to be pretty good at concentrating the heat in the ocean. Um, and so people often say, you know, you would get some climate that would be colder. Um, but that just turned out probably wouldn't happen. But I think it's also not just here. Um, so it's just the atmosphere is not a different climate for that. And it might be just drinking. Yeah. I've thought that the Gulf Stream, et cetera, shuts down for years and years worldwide, five degrees Celsius hotter. Britain doesn't get particularly hotter. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it actually, I mean, yeah, the ocean temperatures do have some effect in that. Um, you know, there's variability in the ocean, too. The ocean has weather systems, essentially. They have these same kinds of storms, just on a different spatial scale and a different time scale. And actually, they can last much longer in the ocean. So the kind of ocean weather can lead to very prolonged changes in Europe. So you can have a whole um, season that's affected by strange 
oceanic conditions. Um, usually the, the change won't be as big as if you had strange weather conditions, but, but it, the average will be very different for the whole season. Yeah, sure. Is there something that would show that Boston in like 20 years? In 20 years. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Well, let's let's just look at this really quick. Um, so this this website, if you look on the side, also has some statistical downscaling. So so this the one that I've linked to is mostly for climate models, and that's kind of coarser resolution. So you could pick out the spot where Boston is, but it, it won't be that realistic because it's it's not resolving all the details. Um, but you can, I think, look at at these downscaling links as well, where you try to take the course uh, estimates from the climate models. And then based on the observations from um, the local conditions and how they compare to the large scale, try to guess at what the difference would be like. Um, and it looks like, um, I think you can, yeah, let me, let me just try. Yeah, I'll just uh, open it and see. Um, so right, so here, for example, we can choose our emission scenario. I guess they've only got the A2 emission scenario. Um, I forget what A2 is. A1B is business as usual. A2 is, I think, constant emissions over time. Um, and so we can zoom in on Boston. What are we actually plotting here? OK. Um, that's some kind of precipitation. But let's go to temperature. Um, there are a lot of variables. So there's no shortage of data here. Let's look at ground temperature, say. Um, and that's in 1968 right now, and we can go all the way up to 2099. Um, now I'm not, I don't want to endorse this because I don't actually think that you can necessarily make a good prediction <laughs> for Boston uh, in 2099, but uh, for what it's worth, here it is. Um, I guess you can, yeah, the color bar is not very good. Um, but green looks like, OK, oh, here it is. So if you mouse over it, it will tell you what it is. And that's in December, or in, oh, today in uh, 2099. It'll be, they say, between 6, somewhere between 6 and 8C. I can't quite eyeball it. <laughs> um, but the point being that you can kind of, you know, you can play around with this and zoom in and um, and look at the different scenarios and look at different time periods and different variables. Um, so it's saying that, that on this day in 2099, this particular climate model is predicting it will be somewhere around 7 or 8. See, Karen's going to get a better color bar for us here. <laughs> if you go up to like, do it from 4 to 10, oh, yeah. that'll be. Oh. Um. Okay, so yeah, maybe about eight C, on average. Yeah, so that would be. Uh, I can't do the conversion, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's that's slightly higher. Yeah, uh, must be. Yeah, eight C. The average temperature today is probably higher than the temperature was today. Uh, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. <laughs> Yeah, 47. It's pretty warm for for mid-November. No, 47 Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. No, I think that. Uh, this is this should be anomalous. This is anomalous temperature. Yeah. So yeah, actually, I guess I need to go higher in my color bar. Yeah. Um. So. Lower. <laughs> um. Anyways, yeah, like I guess Somewhere like around. six to seven degrees hotter is their estimate. Yeah. So yeah, and these so this of course is not data because we're talking twenty ninety nine. So this depends on what like emission scenario you assume. So what you assume about how we'll continue to industrialize, um, and also what model you use. And so here you can see that there's actually about twenty one climate models available, but here they have four you can look at. So we could look at a different model. Um, 
Yeah, and a good, good and way to get an idea of a... how good the prediction is is to look across the different models and see if they agree. And in places where they disagree, it usually means that there's some aspect of the physics there that um, is fundamentally very uncertain. This model didn't seem to downscale in this location. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I haven't actually used this tool much before, but um, the other one on this website, just the, the general kind of uh, climate model one that isn't statistically trying to, to downscale and get local predictions, uh, I think is a really nice viewer. Um, and you can uh, look kind of over large regions. Um, so this is looking at the average across all climate models of you the... You some like, interesting patterns in this, like for instance, we tend to believe that the high northern latitudes are more and more impacted in the rest of the world, and we're already kind of observing that um, land warming more than ocean. Um, which is actually really important because people often talk about global average temperature change in the year of maybe two degrees Celsius. And I think there are two problems with that. One, America's in Fahrenheit, so they don't realize how high two degrees Celsius is. <laughs> but two, 70% of the world's in water and the oceans warm less. So there needs to be kind of a scaling factor, um, you know, of you know, 150% or something in terms of moving from you know, the global average temperature to actually moving really into this. Yeah. And so this is looking at uh, 2050 to 2074 versus basically present day, and this is annual mean temperature. Um, and you can break it down by country to get these bar plots at the bottom. So if we want to look just at the U.S., you see down here the red time series here is by month what the average temperature of the U.S. would be in, uh, in 2050 according to this, the average of all these climate models. Um, and that's compared to the blue is, is the modern. And you can see the climate models um, are in blue and the observations are in black. So the climate models are actually predicting the present climate fairly well, at least the, the average of it over the US. Um, and it's predicting that we'd get an increase um, in the coming century. Uh, Does that jive with what you think? Like it looks to me like the 2050 is like sort of a universal yeah. Yeah, I think well the, the simplest thing would be if it just shifts it all upwards. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of the starting point is uh, you know, because the, the temperature increases are largely coming from uh, CO two, which is giving radiative forcing. It's a fairly direct and uniform heating that it applies. Um, so the simplest thing, yeah, would be that it's shifting upwards. You get Arctic amplification, like Karen was talking about, due to some feedbacks and other things going on. But for a place like the U.S., where probably the, the I don't know, the, there's not a whole lot of like sea ice in the U.S., for example, to retreat. So, so you don't get a feedback from that. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think just a uniform upward shift is, is probably the simplest explanation here, which is probably what we're saying. I guess the U.S. is Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. And again, right. Part of it is just that we're averaging over the whole country, and so you'll tend to get smoother uh, changes. But right, if you looked in in one spot like Boston, like we were just looking at, you could get some noise in that. Um, and and here again, you can just change it and say we want to look at precipitation. Um, now here's a situation where we see the danger of climate models. Um, climate models are very bad at doing precipitation. And you can see that in this case, the observations are further from the current uh, modeled climate than they are, or than the current modeled climate is from the future modeled climate. So you might expect that the changes are actually going to be less um, than if you just took the red and the black lines alone. Yeah, it's not a simple transformation, it turns out. Yeah, it, is, um, it depends a lot on a lot of different parameters. So everything from the soil composition, you know, is it um, fine grained or is it, is it clay, is it um, vegetated or not, because that'll define how much water it can hold. Um, but then also, right, what types of temperature changes are you getting, and even what type of rainfall, right? So if you get heavier rain, often that will just turn into runoff, because you get all of it at once. You can have these flash floods that don't actually have time to absorb. So the infiltration time scale in soil is long enough that some of these more extreme events um, wouldn't actually be absorbed. And so it's, it's difficult to know uh, in general. 
Ja? There's some interesting ideas too, like having concrete that's permeable. Um, there are companies that are developing cement that actually will let you absorb water through it into um, the existing soil while still having the kind of me mechanical properties that are useful to have in concrete. So there are a lot of exciting kind of engineering ideas about out there about how to deal with these kinds of problems. It seems like the fact that the concrete would, concrete not permeable would help the soil moisture, whatever soil moisture is under, is going to keep it there. Yeah. <laughs> and it won't be able to evaporate, right? So yeah. Kind of good. Yeah, it's a... Uh, <laughs> in a way, you don't care about that soil moisture, because... Right. Unless you're saying, because you're not... Yeah. You're, if it was totally capped, let's say it's in the concrete box, of course, it's connected horizontally, but you're either adding or taking away the moisture, and so right. in terms of buffering, say, enhanced heat going to your climate system, it's not going to help. Um, and then, furthermore, it's... Um, you're not losing it, you're not gaining more yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you wouldn't want to use it in here, for example, where we already have enough problems with our roads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and also if you if you get dirt in it, for example, it degrades it. So there's, you know, there's additional maintenance costs that are associated with that. But it's fun to think about. It's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, in different places use different types of concrete for for freezing and for other reasons too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I saw that. I never made that, but. Yes. Yeah. Did I think you're here for two more minutes?